You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr. Zoe Jacobs, and today I'm joined by Dr. Joelle Hershey to talk about the extreme temperatures that have recently been recorded across the global ocean um, and how this might be down to something called El Nino. So welcome, Joelle. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, Zoe. Pleasure to be here. Good. So um, before we get on to that, I'm going to ask you a random ocean question. So um, yours is, what is your favorite ocean animal? I think it would have to be a dolphin. I would actually probably even say uh, albatross is, but it's it's Ooh. not exactly, they're not living in the ocean. So let's go for dolphin. Yeah, I, I like dolphins as well, or turtles, tropical ones. <laughs> Um, so before we get on to um, the topic of the podcast, I wonder if you could give us a bit about your background, how you came to NOC? Uh, well, my background is in uh, physics and mathematics and doing my PhD, I came to Oceanography. I enjoyed it very much and uh, came for a postdoc to Southampton and I've been there ever since. And I'm ocean model, trying to simulate the ocean using computer models, understanding ocean currents, how they interact with climate. And uh, now I'm the associate head of the Marine System Modeling Group. Cool. Um, and how long have you worked at NOC for now? Uh, I came here in 2001, so it's 22 years. Wow. Yeah, that's scary amazing. stuff. That's amazing. I mean, I've been here for 10 years now, so that sounds... I've got, I've got double it and then I get to your, <laughs> to your level. Um, okay, so before we get on to extreme temperatures, um, can you tell us exactly how we measure and monitor the ocean temperature? Yeah, sure. So uh, if we go back further, uh, early... You know, 19th, uh, 20th century, early 20th century, uh, that was mainly ship measurements, measurements, opportunis opportunistic measurements as ships were crossing the oceans, sailing across the oceans. Uh, so obviously plenty of gaps. And uh, that really only got closed in uh, since 1980, 1981 onwards with the advent of satellite observations. Mm. So now there were first truly global data sets for the surface ocean temperatures. Uh, that has been available since 1981 and obviously ongoing now. And uh, so the surface, we have very good coverage throughout, uh, a con continuous coverage. The same is not true for the subsurface. That is improving, but there are still many gaps there. Mm, of course. So if we want to measure the, the deeper ocean, um, do we still have to use kind of traditional methods to do that? Not the traditional ones. So they have floats called Argo floats, for example, that are drifting with the ocean currents and they can move automatically up and down the water column, measuring various properties like temperatures, salinities or biogeochemical properties. Now, and they typically cover the top two kilometers of the ocean, but now increasingly they are developing devices that can go down to six kilometers. Oh, wow, that's cool. Um, but we do still send ships out, don't we, as well? Of course, that yeah. is still happening very much. Uh, many observational programs would not work without ships. No, of course. And for those, we kind of, um, they go out to a particular location and they can kind of perform repeat, rep uh, repeat measurements throughout the ocean column. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. For example, they would do that mm. uh, at the location where we monitor the MOC, the Atlantic Mineral Overturning Circulation. In the North Atlantic, there are regular repeat sections. There are repeat sections across the, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, uh, linking uh, South America to Antarctica. And these sections are being repeated on a regular basis and mm. they are very precious. Mm, absolutely. And I guess that means we can kind of start to measure how the ocean temperature is changing, especially at certain locations, if we have these repeat measurements. Yes. Yeah. So how have the temperatures changed then since uh, pre-industrial times? So in the last 100 or so years, the increase has been about one degree Celsius. Okay. So 1.8 Fahrenheit, one degree Celsius. And that's on average for the global ocean? That is the global ocean temperatures. So some regions may have warmed faster than others. Mm. And yeah. Yeah. Can you give some examples of regions that maybe have warmed a bit faster than others? Well, the North Atlantic is a region yeah. that has warmed uh, quite a bit in mm. recent years. Uh, obviously, there are also cycles, which is something we're trying to understand. And uh, the Southern Ocean around the Antarctica, for example, has warmed rather more slowly okay. than other parts of the globe. Okay, cool. Um, so, on the whole, we kind of we have this background warming that's steadily rising year on year. Um, and actually, it was confirmed that it was the hottest summer on record this year. 
um, which makes sense when I think about all the local or regional records being broken um, on land, but also in the ocean as we um, we saw lots of marine heat waves in 2023. Um, so which regions have been impacted the most this year, would you say? Well, I suppose you've heard a lot about those uh, during the last uh, couple of months. So mm -hmm. there have been a summer has really been uh, characterized by a uh, very pronounced heat waves on all continents, essentially. Uh, North America had a massive one. Uh, Europe, you will remember the massive heat wave mm -hmm. on the Mediterranean, North Africa. Mm -hmm. Even by even by their standards, these were very exceptional temperatures. Uh, regions like uh, China, Thailand had uh, unprecedented temperatures. So a new record, for example, was set in China with uh, 52 degrees, which is mm, uh, wow. truly amazing. Yeah, that's uh, and, very warm. <laughs> Um, and uh, in parallel to that, uh, we had uh, these uh, massive uh, warm spells in the ocean, so the equivalent mm -hmm. of a land heat wave that are uh, the perhaps less reported on heat waves uh, in the ocean, so ocean temperatures that were uh, way above their normal averages. Mm -hmm. And there have been quite a few instances of those in 2023. Mm. Are they linked at all? Yes, I would say so. I mean, still very much, uh, there's still very much uh, the subject of ongoing research. But uh, so the one that really stood out in, from what I've seen is uh, the one in the North Atlantic around Britain. So this is the mm -hmm. one that was quite widely reported on uh, uh, in the news here in the UK. So that is uh, peaked in June, really started developing in, uh, in May and peaked in June. So that was up to uh, uh, five degrees higher than average, which is a uh, quite a lot, really. Mm. But that's what not happening in isolation. So your question, uh, is it just happening uh, randomly in a, in a location? Uh, no, it is not. In parallel, we had uh, also warm spells developing, a uh, very warm spell that actually is still ongoing now uh, in the Sea of Japan mm -hmm. uh, and uh, off into the Pacific, off in the, to the Kuroshio extension. And that has been there on, has been modulated during them over the months, but has been quite persistent for most of the year. And in parallel, we also had the Mediterranean. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that is still now still way above average temperature. And the link to that is um, uh, these uh, marine heat waves are obviously also an expression as to what is happening in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the large scale atmospheric features that led to what's happened in the North Atlantic uh, are linked to what is happening in the Pacific. Mm. So uh, 2023 was uh, characterized by uh, a number of uh, instances where the jet stream got uh, blocked. That means uh, the jet stream, for those who don't know about it, it's a, a ribbon of air high up in the atmosphere, uh, like, an, like a river of air that drives the main weather systems and normally it meanders around, uh, but sometimes again, it can get stuck. So there is a wave shape that develops and that can stay there for weeks and sometimes even months. And so, and that can happen on almost a, a, a hemispheric uh, scale, meaning that warm extremes or cold extremes actually can happen simultaneously around mm -hmm. the globe. And I think we've seen quite a bit of that in 2023. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially as you were saying, the kind of hot spots were happening in the northern hemisphere. So it would make sense if it was all kind of linked to that. Um, I like the river of air description of the jet stream. That's very good. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that makes complete sense. So um, these kind of increasing uh, extremes that we're seeing, um, could this be due to the climate uh, phenomena El Nino? Um, can you tell us what the El Nino is? Uh, yes, sure. Uh so uh, El Nino is um, <coughs> it's the most pronounced uh, mode of uh, climate variability that we have in the climate system, mm -hmm. apart from the seasonal cycle. Mm -hmm. Nothing beats the seasonal cycle. But next comes El Nino. Is, uh, El Nino is a uh, fluctuations of uh, ocean temperatures in the Pacific. And that uh, comes as a, it's uh, rather irregular, but on average it's between uh, every two to seven years, that's when you have an El Nino event. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah, so now I was just going to ask, how does it affect our, how does it affect yeah. our ocean temperatures? Yeah. So uh, I can perhaps describe a bit what it is. So mm. El Nino is the phase that we're moving into right now, by the mm -hmm. way. 
So during an, an El Nino phase, uh, the uh, the Eastern Pacific mm -hmm. uh, warms more than average. So okay. what we have in the Pacific, the Pacific normally is characterized by a warm pool of water that sits in the western part of the Pacific. So temperatures of around 30 degrees are quite common in that patch of water and it's a few hundred meters. It's quite deep actually. Mm. And uh, every couple of years that uh, pool of warm water spreads eastwards and can spread all the way eastwards uh, until it reaches the coast of South America, of Peru in particular. And when that happens, that is linked obviously to changes in the atmospheric circulation. And there's still a debate going on, what is driving what? Is it the atmosphere that drives right. uh, this uh, uh, spillage, this spill of the uh, pa uh, Pacific warm pool eastwards? Or is it an ocean phenomenon? I would really consider it a coupled phenomenon. So we, mm. we need both interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere to make it happen. Mm. So am I right in thinking that the, uh, when this El Nino is happening, obviously some of the largest changes in temperature we're seeing are in the Pacific, but the, the effects are felt kind of globally. Is that right? Yes. So there is a whole raft of teleconnections, so-called teleconnections, in the climate system that mm. are linked to El Nino. Mm. So they are most pronounced around the Pacific Basin, obviously, as you would expect. Yeah. So uh, of South America, when you have a, an El Nino event, you tend to get more convection in the atmosphere, meaning more convective rainfall. So regions uh, like Peru, for example, mm. uh, Lima is rather a, a pretty dry region, a pretty dry town normally. Mm. During El Nino, they can get repeated torrential downpours. I see, yeah. And uh, at the same time, regions where normally that would happen in the West Pacific, mm. so that is perhaps the maritime continent, that is uh, Indonesia, reg regions of e East Asia, uh, will get less convection, less convective rainfall. So they, they will tend to be drier than normal. Mm, okay. And, and definitely further afield, right? We can even feel uh, changes. We can, it, it has impacts mm. uh, all around the globe. Uh, uh, certainly into North and South America. Mm -hmm. So there is a clear link between what's happening with El Nino and winters in uh, North America. Uh, they are also linked to Europe, but these links are not very statistically right. not robust. Okay. So, so we can't use El Nino, for example, to say, uh, oh, there is an El Nino event. Our winter is going to be warmer or colder. Right, I see. So th it's not like that. So yeah. there is the, 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 the influence is weak. Right, or for, for Europe. So it's not a good predictor for what's yeah, going to happen in Europe. It's just a statistical measure, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, but what is clear, it does kick off perturbations yeah. that reverberate around the globe. Yes. And when we are, when there is an El Nino happening, like there is now, um, it's normal, isn't it, that the global temperatures are higher than normal? Indeed. So as I said, it's like you have that warm pool that is in the West Pacific mm -hmm. that is quite, uh, that is quite thick. And as it spreads out, mm. it means the surface temperature, the larger fraction of the globe, of the global ocean, that is covered by warmer than average ocean. Mm -hmm. And that pushes up the global temperatures, not just in the ocean, yeah. but in the atmosphere as well. So going into the past, uh, the previous record holder years uh, were 1998, for example, mm -hmm. or 2016. Okay. Both these years were El Nino years. And uh, so the fact that they reached uh, and, and the warmest year were not just in the ocean, but in the atmosphere. Mm. So, and that was really linked to this r distribution of heat. So it redistributes the heat into a thinner layer on top of the, of the ocean, which is then being felt by the atmosphere and also favors warmer atmospheric temperatures. Yeah. Cool. That makes complete sense. So um, you just mentioned then some notable El Nino's that have happened in the past, so yes. 1998 and uh, 2016. Um, so do we do we know that they had a significant impact on the ocean? Yes, they do. I mean, the first thing is obviously the the temperature that is visible. Yeah, that is the most obvious thing. It, it has obvious, obvious implications for the. Uh, you will probably know about that. Uh, the Eastern Pacific is mm -hmm. a massive upwelling region. Mm -hmm. So there are nutrients being upwelled to the surface. During El Nino, that upwelling of cooler waters is suppressed. Mm. So that has massive impact on fisheries on these, in, these, in these regions. Yeah. 
they are well equipped for it because they kn they've known that. I mean, El Nino has been known, uh, I mean, since pre-Columbian uh, days, they, know, they knew about it. They didn't mm. know the mechanism, but they knew about it and they knew what it meant for their f local fisheries. Yeah, because I, I have read before that, um, especially, especially those exact uh, fisheries off the coast of uh, Peru and Chile, the fishery, the normal fisheries there during an El Nino can move around, which can which can then lead to some impacts yes. for the fishermen and then the, the society um, and the economy yep. as well of those countries. Yeah, yep. and other impacts is um, uh, the bleaching of corals. Yeah. So some regions doing El Nino as the temperatures reach uh, very high levels. Mm. Uh, so that really kicked off in 1998. It's the first time that coral bleaching really had a, a, a became known a bit to, to, a, to a wider public. Yeah. It, and uh, now it can even happen in normal, mm. normal years without El Nino. Yeah. But obviously, if you have an El Nino for in some regions, it's going to even exacerbate that, yeah. of course. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so there is the, the the opposite of an El Nino, which is called uh, La Nina. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? How is that different? Yeah. Well, uh, La Nina, I mean, as the name says, it's, uh, it's the cold sister uh, of uh, El Nino. Mm -hmm. So this is almost the reverse pattern. Yeah. So what happens then after an El Nino, as the uh, uh, North Pacific, uh, sorry, as the Pacific warm pool builds up, there is a phase where temperatures uh, become colder than normal in the East Pacific okay. along the tropics. And that then there's a tongue of cold water that develops mm. that can then spread westwards uh, uh, and can spread well into the locations where normally you would have the Pacific warm right. pool. So we have a cold anomaly there. Right. And again, this has a marked uh, consequences for, uh, for, for our climate. Mm. So uh, we just come out of a three-year phase of a weakish La Nina after the pronounced uh, 2016 uh, uh, El Nino event, uh, uh, El Nino event, and uh, that led to uh, that did upset weather patterns quite a bit, flooding in Australia, yeah. uh, droughts in other places. So, so that had had massive impacts. Yeah, it's just the contrary; it's just opposite mm. to El Nino uh, of Peru, for example. It means there is even less rainfall because. Uh, the water being quite c colder than normal, mm. it suppresses convection even more than normal, which is not conducive to rainfall. So, so it means these mm. regions get drier than normal. Yeah, I see. So it's kind of like after an El Nino, the system's kind of going back to normal, but it almost overshoots and makes it kind of a bit more yes. of an extreme normal situation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Um, so um, as we've said, so we have an El Nino happening at the moment. Um, there's lots of temp ocean temperature records being broken. How concerning is this? Well, to be honest, I am not really surprised mm -hmm. to see that. I mean, we should all be concerned about <laughs> the global warming that is going unabated. Mm. But uh, that 2023 looks the way it does is not really a surprise. Uh, as you just said, the temperatures are gradually increasing. And we are definitely in that phase now. It's, it's uh, yeah. after perhaps that it sometimes is a bit faster, sometimes mm -hmm. it's a bit slower. Uh, at the moment, we are in a phase where the warming is rather uh, faster than it was perhaps a few years earlier. Yeah. But on top of that, you have these oscillations. And uh, therefore, since we are in a moving climate, in a transiently moving and warming climate, as you have these oscillations like El Nino, mm. uh, uh, you will uh, punch the ceiling of uh, observations that we've had before. Mm. That's exactly what we're seeing in 2023. Mm. So uh, it is concerning, yes, but unexpected, it is not. Yeah. No, because uh, if, again, that's what the, the past teaches us, go back to 1998, mm -hmm. 97, 98, at the time, we looked at the observations at the time, the El Nino of 1998 was already uh, stood out almost as clearly as 2023 does now mm -hmm. from the background that we yeah. had back then. And then uh, the next, the, and then uh, 2016, 2016 was the same story again. Mm -hmm. That that was the warmest year on record prior to 2023. Yeah. Again, that pushed things up, not by quite as much as a uh, 2023, uh, mm -hmm. but again, that was the, that was the record year. Yeah. So rather than a, 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 a El Nino being surprised by El Nino uh, leading to new records. I think the main question is more 
why were the previous years so warm? Mm. As I mentioned, 2016 was the previous record holder, yeah. was an, an El Nino, and that was followed by three years of El La Nina conditions mm -hmm. that are colder than mm. normal, not just in the Pacific, but globally. Yeah. And despite that, uh, that pattern being prevalent, uh, the global temperatures in the ocean and in the atmosphere were very, very close to their record of 2016. Okay. So despite there being an, a La Nina, La Nina conditions, uh, we were, the, the world was very close to its mm. warmest. Therefore, now that's flipping to an El Nino. Mm. Now we're actually really moving decisively higher than what we've seen before. Mm. That is expected. Yeah. Um, but we are coming to the end of 2023. Um, what about next year, 2024? Is the El Nino likely to continue into next year? Well, El Nino uh, normally reaches its maximum expression around Christmas time. That's actually the origin of the name uh, El Nino. Mm. El Nino from a uh, well, well, little Jesus yeah. in Spanish. So, uh, uh, so it's going to be most pronounced typically around uh, the end of the year, and it's going to mm. it's going to go beyond. It's going to go into 2024. So, uh, if it's a an average length El Nino, you would expect it to start to tail off mm. in a perhaps April, May, June, okay. 2024. But until then, uh, the temperatures are going to uh, stay very high mm -hmm. and in terms of global ocean temperatures uh, new records may be possible in May in March okay around March time because there are two maxima in the global ocean temperatures if you look at the if you take the globe look at the global average one is in August September the other one is in a, around late February March okay. so uh, uh, whether it's going to be higher than what we saw early this year that I will not venture and try to make no. a prediction, <laughs> but uh, it's but we know it's going to be very yeah. close. It's either going to be slightly above or slightly below, but yeah. it's going to go up. Yeah, of course. Um, so you kind of just touched on my next question. So you said earlier that um, the El Nino kind of comes around every two to seven years, roughly. Um, is it possible to forecast when an El Nino is going to happen? At the moment, not, for example, several years in advance. Mm -hmm. However, uh, during a year when an El Nino is developing, we have a good advance warning that something is happening. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the mid 1980s, uh, an array of moorings was deployed in the Pacific called the Tao Toga Array. And uh, uh, so they, these moorings, they measure temperatures is, uh, subsurface across the tropical Pacific. Mm -hmm. There is a series of mooring mm -hmm. that then transmit the data back to us, uh, uh, back by a satellite. Mm. And from that, we know if there are changes, subtle changes in the ocean when the warm pool starts to move, the first signs of that are actually seen below the surface. It's mm. not at the surface that we see the first signs of mm. and then developing El Nino. And these moorings are, can capture these signals and transmit them. And so thanks to that, we actually have an advance warning by, for, by at least a couple of months. Yeah. So El Nino doesn't just come out of the blue. Mm, that's handy. <laughs> um, is there any way to mitigate these effects or do we just kind of have to adapt to El Nino? Well, society has, uh, has actually adjusted to it since, mm. uh, since the dawn of times. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, the way to adapt is since you know some regions are going to be drier, some regions are going to be wetter, mm. then you may adjust your crop. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, if, uh, it's, if it's a region where you tend to plant rice, maybe you may want to go, uh, go more wheat, less rice, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So by planning, and they do that. So these, yeah. so, so these warnings, they do go out. So certainly around the Pacific, uh, the Pacific nations, uh, they would plan accordingly when they know that there is an El Nino coming, uh, that information is passed on. Mm. And so uh, wh whether people then act on it or not, that is their decision. But the information is out there. Mm. That's really cool. Um, okay, so just to finish off then, um, are you able to give us kind of a teaser of what you're working on now uh, in relation to extreme temperatures? Any interesting projects coming up, that kind of thing? Uh, well, I just have a PhD student who mm -hmm. started uh, a few weeks back and his PhD is really about uh, uh, studying the ocean influence on recent climate extremes. Mm. So that's exactly uh, Perfect timing. Uh, that uh, <laughs> links quite nicely mm. to what we've been talking about. Yeah. And no, uh, so I'm very much looking forward to see what comes out of that project. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, it's my pleasure.
Thanks for having me. If you're enjoying Into the Blue, please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. New episodes are released every other Wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the NOC's YouTube. See you next time.